Okay, so uh, here was the idea behind the talk in the meeting. Uh, really, the goal is what can you build for around five hundred dollars that runs real well on Linux. And uh, this is a little bit of a continuation of an earlier build that that uh, was done. Uh, Micro Center was really very very helpful in in uh, helping to piece together the parts on this. Uh, Shankar as well. Unfortunately, Shankar uh, at, at the last minute had uh, personal travel he had to make and unfortunately couldn't come. So we'll be short his expert knowledge on the uh, AMD architecture, but uh, hopefully he'll be able to follow up with a presentation in the future. And so I guess as we go through this, and, uh, and Kurt also has a build that he's going to talk about, uh, but if we can come up with a list of things that we'd like to do in the future, certainly I'd be willing to sign up and do some more performance-related things in particular. But um, so the way this this uh, arose back in August of 2020, I had done an earlier uh, bargain build system, and uh, I'll walk through that just a little bit as a recap. And so this was an opportunity to see what's new in roughly that same price range. Uh, here was a slide from that build a little while ago. Uh, this is what the configuration of that system look like and one of the great things about this if if uh, uh i don't know if we can do a show of hands or some way that as we go on here to find out uh, if people have built their own their own boxes in the past or they plan to in the future but it, it's just a great way to to piece through what the different parts are uh I got some there we go wow i got a floating thumbs up but i don't know who did that but it's uh, it was really very cool um and, and speaking of cool, uh, the the mini tower case that was used uh, was a cool mast, uh, and uh, the, the processor back in August 2020 was a Ryzen 3. The, the and here's where Shankar really could have done uh, a great, great, uh, you know, addition to what we're going to talk about. But we'll work around that. Uh, the next piece down was a 650 watt power supply. Uh, we'll we'll compare that system in 2020 to this system now you'll see similar parts but different uh, skus in some sense uh, a key idea here is that and and bob was talking about the nmea uh, drives which is a big uh, newness of this new build uh, using an ssd drive as your system drive is is uh, as, as your your boot operating system drive is just like a huge difference in 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 uh, performance from my experience so just take out the old rush drive uh, for your boot system put it in an ssd or even better nmea maybe and uh, we can talk more about the maybe some pros and cons on that but huge performance difference uh, here we have memory and kurt may want to address a little bit of the memory uh, he observed that the default configurations in the motherboards when we popped in this new memory might not be getting the full speed out of it I never got to the point where I was able to uh, reconfigure it, and it was largely just because I, I was uh, thrilled to get using the box, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, this old uh, build from August 2020, which I do still use and actually primarily use it for uh, video uh, processing, video editing, which you might not think for an older, slower machine, but works great. Uh, two terabyte drive, and that was the, the motherboard uh, of the time in ASUS. Have a little story on the, on the motherboard situation. Uh, here we go, fast forward to today. Uh, so there are uh, four different build configurations that you'll see here. And uh, the, the one that uh, at different points in the build process, I kind of ended up with a little bit of all of them. But just to quickly go through it, uh, the Ryzen 5 uh, was the anchor of, of the build. At one point, I wasn't going to do the build, as John and Jer Jerry will know, because it looked like I wasn't going to be able to get one through the the, the, the kind of the common um, uh, cost-effective channels. Uh, so, for instance, Newegg was kind of, th their lead time was a couple of weeks out, and I didn't feel that was enough time to put it together. Uh, at one point, Micro Center didn't have the Ryzen in stock. And I did call their corporate headquarters, and they thought it was going to be a couple of weeks or more. Anyways, it, it turned out I was able to get it within a couple of days. So uh, the Ryzen 5, uh, the motherboard, I kind of put a category column uh, up there on the left-hand side. So the CPU, the, mo the MOBO, 
originally there was another board that we had specced and it looked like it was going to be okay and it just frankly didn't work for me so a little bit embarrassing but um i, I built the system with the ryzen 5 you know and it didn't work and came to find out the reason it didn't work is because it really shouldn't have been working with that motherboard anyways so uh went to a new board with the asus uh, that was geared to it uh, somebody else on the the call might uh, have some understanding as to why the board didn't work the, the the cpu fit the m4 socket i think it is fit but of course the motherboard wasn't primed for it um th there's uh, uh, you know another basic case 50 bucks amazing what you can get for a case uh, this mother, this power supply in this case was a 550 watt power supply, 60 bucks. Uh, and and I'll tell you, one of the best deals in all of this. It's a little bit embarrassing to say, but uh, the keyboard at 399 is it's just a beautiful keyboard. Uh, the, the the keys are soft and and responsive, and it's got you know all the function keys and uh, numeric keypads that you want. So it's time to throw out your old dusty, crusty the ones that are missing the letter M and pick up a real cheap one uh, as quick as you can. We go through now, oh, I guess the second best thing in the build was was the mouse. You know, it's got a, uh, Bob was talking about the LEDs and and uh, it's got a kind of a nice little, uh, I'll post a picture in, in the aftermath of this, but it's got a glowing uh, LED light that changes colors over time and it sort of has a life to it. The beauty of it is, you know, when the pod, the system is booted up because the uh, USB lights up, it, you'll see a whole bunch of disk stuff. There's an enormous amount of disk stuff. It would be nice if there was a way to just eliminate the disk stuff, uh, whether it's cables or mounting brackets. Anyways, uh, the, the I tried different combinations of almost all of these things, SSDs and NMEAs and multi-terabyte and smaller terabyte and bigger terabyte and USB terabyte. Um, you can do it all, and and uh, that's that's pretty cool. It works well. Of course, going down to the operating system, uh, you know, left out Windows from this particular build, and not only did it save money, but, uh, you know, but anyways, it, it was nice to leave it out. I, I came up short on HDMI cables. Could have saved a few bucks if I didn't have to. Turned out these HDMI cables, a three pack for uh, for three thirty five ninety eight. You know, it turned out you end up buying one of them for uh, almost as much it seemed. Uh, so uh, the memory, which was uh, DDR four thirty two hundreds, seemed like a really pretty pretty decent price, sixteen gig, and we can talk about the speeds. Uh, the, the the one thing that I often forget, you know, when you get the SSDs, you get the two and a half inch drives. You forget that six dollar mounting bracket, and then you got to go back to the store and buy one. Um, cables is another thing you never. I anyways, I don't never ever seem to have quite enough cables. But so the 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 four different build configurations. Uh, at one point, I had the higher priced one, kind of around build two, build three, and really what I settled with in more or less what I'm working with now is build four. And one of the SSDs I plopped in from uh, the shelf that that uh, I had an extra one lying around. It, you folks almost certainly have extra ones lying around. Here's a profile of the 3200G. I think the main difference uh, is the, the number of threads. Uh, the, the the power is something that I was kind of interested in to have the thing run fairly cool and inexpensively. Uh, as you see here, the 5600. 12 threads, right? Uh, L2 cache is three megabyte. Here, the L2 cache was two megabyte. Uh, the, the We can go back and forth on these a little bit. Base clock is 33.9. And uh, over here, it, it's it's kind of in the same ballpark. And we can talk a little bit about that uh, and, and what the performance differences are. So here's what I did to do, uh, and this is really cheap and dirty uh, performance uh, testing. So, so I will say this. The uh, AMD 5, uh, as soon as I get the system put together, I have it running on, you know, kind of a, a big giant screen. Uh, it feels fast. It feels uh, smooth. Uh, I've had no hiccups at all. I have a, a gazillion terabytes, slight exaggeration, but I have a lot of terabytes hanging off of it, and uh, I've had no hiccups. It, it The 12 threads has got to have something to do with it. The six cores, the... the um, there were four cores on the 3200, and so the additional cores and the extra threads, the thing just really uh, hums right along. Uh, I, I was a little bit envious of Bob. I have a Nook as well. It definitely doesn't have a Core 9 in it, 
Um, but but this is a decent system. I'm quite pleased. So what I did to run some cheap and dirty, quick and dirty uh, performance tests is I wrote a couple of simple uh, Go uh, programs, and I then ran them on three different, four different systems. One, the new build. Two, the uh, 3200 build. Three, this laptop that I'm giving this presentation on. And four, uh, a Mac Mini. And and uh, it was interesting, the results. I guess you get down to the bottom line on, so this is the budget bill from August of 2020 to run this particular collection of, uh, you know, Fibonacci sequence and prime number sequence. Nothing too sophisticated. It's not hitting, um, you know, disk, really. It's, it's not messing with memory much. And so in some sense, it's just a, a processor test. Uh, I'd love to, to get some insight from uh, Shankar in the future for a few more sophisticated tests that could be done uh, where I could test the, isolate the CPUs. Uh, this is the build of the machine, the, the, the current R5 machine. And uh, so you see this particular set of performance tests uh, ran for 13.3 seconds roughly, whereas it was 15.6. Uh, so you you know you can imagine if you're shaving off a couple of seconds on just simple little uh, tests over time, it could add up. The laptop, frankly, to my surprise, it's it's a multi-year-old i5. Uh, was 12.8 seconds for this particular set of tests. Uh, it's an L Intel chip, as you can see, and uh, no doubt your mileage would be better with faster chips. Uh, and then the Mac Mini kind of cruises along at, uh, you know, in, in roughly the same ballpark as the R5, which I think this is an M1 Mac Mini, relatively new, modern. Uh, the price is around 600 bucks for it. I'd, I'd have to check and your mileage may vary based on what the current models are and the the the, uh, the costs are, the sales are. Uh, the downside of the Mac Mini is it does have an SSD, which is kind of nice. I think the one I have is around 250 gig. Uh, that is a whole lot less than the terabytes that I have in these other systems. And for me, that's been a real, uh, you know, kind of impediment, but the Mac mini is a great box to have. Uh, just to show you, uh, we can come back to this, the motherboard overview, and Kurt may also want to talk about this a little bit. Uh, the thing that I always run into is uh, is those header uh, connectors. And, and you know, the, the uh, some of them, they're all just plus minus, connectors or in some cases plus minus minus connectors and you always have one extra or one too few uh, so this is something that i ended up having to go to the manual for the labeling is usually kind of uh, you know a anyways the motherboard great motherboard uh the case great case but on this i had to read the the manual so this is what i had to read and and it's it's you know and i also had to get out the magnifying glass uh to see what goes where and which of these kind of connect, are they horizontal or vertical? Or uh, I don't know if anybody's ever burned out a motherboard by uh, misconnecting these things. I'd love to hear your experiences. Uh, another thing, well, you know, uh, SATA cables, how you connect them, are they angled or not? Do you have the right ones? Do you have enough of them? And, and, uh, and can you read what they actually are? Uh, I had to take about eight pictures to get this to point out, uh, you know, that this actually said SATA. On it and what the speed was. Um, so here are the brackets we talked about. Uh, the, the 120 gigabyte SSD is uh, a vintage one, um, but it works actually great. You notice the speeds, the read speed, write speed. Of course, the the, the um, uh, you know your numbers may vary again. Uh, we did talk in the, the, the uh, I don't know to what extent you have to be uh, cautious or careful of your write strategies on these different devices. And so at this point in time, for me, they're kind of disposable and in that, and they shouldn't be for the, you know, they still do cost some money, but as you can see, if you look and squint closely, uh, they cost less money certainly than they used to. And so in and around the shelves at Micro Center, uh, they're just, of course, you know, well-stocked with all kinds of SSDs and uh, NMEAs. The NMEAs are behind locked doors. Um, I learned a little bit about NMEAs and there are trade-offs between, uh, you know, speed and life. And it does seem on these, you have to be aware of the burnout factor. And uh, there's nothing like having, you know, backups on, on rust. So uh, the drives, the, the hard drives, the spinning drives, uh, they're cheap, they're plentiful. And uh, the cases that, that I bought 
and and the boards that we have they support gobs and gobs and gobs of these devices uh you know again your mileage may vary if you have a very precise or uh extreme kind of build that you want to this was not intended to be a gaming machine this was intended to be a administrative database -y, um you know image processing to some extent but uh, and and also with basic programming and and uh, the go language i think bob was talking about uh, the Visual Studio stuff, which I would absolutely concur. Uh, I think for a while he tried to get me into it, and for a while I was suspect of uh, was this Microsoft lock-in or something like that. It is really a fabulous development uh, user interface and, and GUI. Uh, so eventually after you, you wire things together and you drop a few screws places that you shouldn't, uh, you then go and install the software. It's, it's, the question is, do you need an S, uh, a CD drive or not? What's your preferred approach? I think it over, I may have installed this multiple ways from thumb drive as well as uh, the, the uh, as well as from a, a DVD, which I installed, which I just connected via uh, the USB interface. So I, I didn't install a, a baked in uh, CD. I didn't give a complete look at what this screen is, but uh, this is kind of what the, when you boot into the system, it comes up with a really elegant dashboard with all the specs on what you've got installed in the, in, in, in the machine. Uh, the basic interface, your BIOS is is now, you know, essentially it looks like a graphical game board. It, it really, it's, I don't know if this is standard, it's the way the ASUS board works and it's just spectacular. This is what the inside of the case looks like. Uh, I managed to not bend any pins. Uh, I managed not to install things backwards. Uh, and, and so I guess I would say this, it's a fairly straightforward process. Anybody who hasn't done it absolutely ought to be encouraged to. Uh, the, you know, they, they seem to be a little bit more, and, and people can criticize me for the uh, ribbony effect of the cabling. Uh, some people really spend a lot of time and and take great pride in it. And um, I tried a little bit, but uh, I, I'm not an artist, I will say that. Uh, one of the things that I did get and, and ultimately returned was, you know, the, the uh, LED enhancements, which now to seem to be almost standard to the point where there is something on the motherboard which allows you to uh, connect. Uh, it'll come to me when we go back and look at the motherboard configuration. But but in fact, the the this motherboard actually has um, an interface designed to support the LED lighting in these machines uh, where you can essentially, and it's got a, an API where you can program it. Uh, in, in the end, I was more interested in price than I was the illumination and, and the mice have pretty nice illumination for free. It was nice when Ubuntu came up uh, really effortlessly, no problems, no glitches. Uh, I was surprised. And, uh, and quite happy, and I've been happily running it ever since. Uh, the machine's been up and running, I think, for around a month or so. Uh, well, it, uh, so November 12th, 21, uh, well, that was the day that I took the pictures. So I guess that's actually a pretty good time span. So just over a month. Um, that's the board, that's the chip, that's the speed. Uh, the memory you can see there uh, for the uh, 16 gig of RAM DDR4, 2133 megahertz, I don't know if that is an error in, in recognizing. I don't know how to test the speed of the chips, but I think uh, Kurt and I both have a 32 uh, megahertz, if I'm not, 3200 megahertz, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, uh, the fan profile, which is just off the bottom there, uh, they do uh, measure the speed at which the, the fans are running. You can tweak some of these things. Uh, it's, it's a fairly customizable motherboard. I didn't touch it, and and uh, I was happy not to. Most of the uh, parts, which I guess I'll, I'll I'll get to maybe at some point. Anyways, this is more of what comes in the the, the packaging. Of course, that's the uh, the back plane. Uh, that's the motherboard. Uh, the two things on the right, the the magnetic pickup tool. People may joke at that, but uh, at five bucks, it was too hard to pass up. Uh, and the screwdriver, not like I didn't have a whole bunch, but mostly took a picture of that. It just to show people that's really all you need to put this together. Uh, those are the nice uh, HDMI cables with the red uh, sort of connectors on them. Uh, those seem really robust. I have had in the past uh, glitchy things. The way this is configured is it's connected to an HDMI TV. 
um, a 4K TV, I should say, and and works beautifully for you know HDMI or 4K TVs. The price that you get them for, I, people can tell me if they're actually buying uh, you know computer monitors, and maybe there are advantages for gaming. But the the, the, the additional desk space, desktop space of the big screen TVs is fabulous. Uh, the ten dollar Pro Sound a multimedia speaker system, uh, I, I, I did buy it on a Lark. And, you know, I was uh, discouraged from buying it, uh, though I wanted to. And, of course, when I plugged it in and I, I went to turn it on, all of the front-facing uh, controls just receded right into the enclosure of the, the speaker system. So um, it wasn't exactly high-quality uh, engineering. Uh, there's the, the magnificent keyboard. Um, I bought a few extras. It was actually on sale. You can see the $4.99 price tag. It was actually a dollar off. So uh, highly recommended. Uh, you, you, the backplane has all kinds of uh, USB. It seems to be, uh, I don't know if it's all USB 3 uh, and maybe even 3.1 or 3.2 or what the latest is. Uh, and and uh, But anyways, it, it's it's got uh, Ethernet, of course, which, you know, everybody needs. And uh, that was a, a picture of the, uh, uh, I guess that was a picture of, MIT on that. I've got a few more pictures, which I will bring up. Maybe if there are any questions, we could kind of go through those now. If anybody has them, I don't know if you want to. Um, oh, coax uh, jacks. I'll, yeah, so the coax jacks, actually it has the, the, the motherboard had a Wi-Fi extension, uh, sort of a Wi-Fi antenna extension, which, which is kind of a nifty little uh, I don't know if I had a picture in it here. Uh, my pictures have disappeared. I'm going to try and pull them back. Uh, anyways, it's it's uh, it's an antenna for Wi-Fi, which I have not used. Uh, how did I configure the Ubuntu to use the NVMe? Uh, literally just comes up looking like uh, a disk. So in brief, uh, NVMe, other people know much more about it than I do. But essentially all it is is and, and, and uh, you just uh, s s s there there are connectors on the motherboard. Uh, it, it's a tiny little thing that looks it's about the size of uh, a piece of Wrigley's gum. And you um, it was one of them was difficult to figure out how I connected it and the other one wasn't. There actually are two NVMe uh, headers, so to speak on this motherboard. And and uh, Ubuntu saw it immediately. It's pretty magical. And the advantage of NVMe, it's basically a PCI connector on board. Uh, people can talk, you know, can discuss this, which is much faster than uh, than the SATA. And and uh, I installed it, and it worked fine. Uh, did I break the home onto the SSD and the VAR temp, et cetera, into the? Not quite sure what that question means, but be glad to answer it if I could. Um, lots of stuff about SMR. Uh, let's see if I, what are the questions that I miss? Uh, NVMe, I, I haven't done extensive testing on it. Uh, they're relatively more expensive than SSDs. They're relatively faster. And, and th there are, uh, basically, I, it was explained to me, the guy at Micro Center was really quite good, that there essentially are three flavors of NVMe. Uh, there's, you know, and, and it's inexpensive, middle priced and higher cost. And, and the three differences, the highest cost ones are the ones that are fast and last a long time. I think generally speaking, the mid priced ones are the ones that are faster and don't last so long. And the cheapest ones are the ones that are like not very fast and they don't last long, w relatively speaking. With that said, uh, you do need a data strategy. I believe if you're going to be using these things for any kind of data storage, on the other hand, if you're using them for your operating system and things like that, you know, it's kind of like burn it out and replace it. M2 drives. Uh, yeah, they do. Uh, uh, th thanks, Bill. Um, they refer to them as M.2 in the documentation. It was a little tricky to find out how to install the, the second one, actually, because oddly enough, the header connectors on this board were different. They were in two different locations. And one of them uh, just kind of clamped on. And the other one, it, it took a little bit more uh, clever effort. Uh, temporary disc, I, uh, bad dog, thanks. Yeah, no, that would be a great idea. I, I did not go in and do any optimization. Um, I, I do have some stats from, I, I did some pretty extensive 
testing of data transfer stuff with the old Ryzen 3. And, and uh, I've since come to the conclusion that it's uh, time consuming and costly to move big data files. So I'm actually personally at work now on uh, rather than moving things, finding them. And I'd be happy to talk to, to folks about that a little bit more in the future. Um, what else is there that people have observations or questions on? Let me see if I can find my photos because I have, I'm not sure where they went. I had some additional photos, but I, I may bring them up after uh, after I sidestep here and let Kurt take the take the stage. So I'll just go back to this uh, one last time, I guess. For not sure, I'll, let's see if I can. Uh, just to go down the list and, and if people have any questions. So net net at the end of the day, uh, it was a little bit over $500. And if, if I'm not sure there's anything much I would have done uh, differently. Uh, you, you can, I may not have included the NVMe uh, cost in this build uh, of the, of the cheapest build, but uh, it's $60 you, you know, for a half a terabyte, it's it's really pretty impressive what you can get uh, these days. So you want to spend a little more money and you can bump up the price. Jerry, back to you. I don't know if you have any questions or if I missed anything. Nope. I was very interested in the build. Uh, you know, I was just answering here. Uh, I've used my uh, M2. I don't know. I don't think it's uh, MBEA. And and whatever it is, but I've got an M2 SSD that I've been using as my primary disk for since I built the system about four years ago. <clears throat> and I had several hard disks that I picked up over over time, and it's an old Penguin system that I bought well over 10 years ago when um, Don... Um, forget Don's last name spoke at the BLU. Yeah, I had, and, and, and I see Mad Dog here, and, and, and John, I don't know if there's any way we can save the chat thread because uh, there's, there's really just tremendous amount of, you know, common shared knowledge. John saves it. John right. saves it, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So uh, there is a dramatic increase, as Mad Dog says, uh, uh, you know, uh, of SSDs. And, and or you're putting them together in a network, there's 12 key components you have to look at. All of these have to be considered uh, and dealt with individually. There's nine system components here and three classes of users. Yep, sorry. I, and, um, in the I meantime, know. what's important? Again, it depends on who. Sounds like your audio is cutting in and out. Yeah, I might have lost him on some things. Well, when he comes back, it seems when I talk, he, he comes back. But um, so, so it was probably about six months ago or so, this laptop I have, which is an H, HP Pavilion Core i5, which has been great. Uh, it certainly is several years old, and and you know, man, I, it it I lost it. The the hard drive just went, and w what a you know kind of a headache that was. I ended up replacing it, uh, which it was a spinning rust hard drive, if I'm not mistaken, with an SSD. And and life is so much faster. But um, I, I really do think I'd urge the caution, particularly as we all move into a world of terabytes of data. And, and recognizing that moving around terabytes of data is, it, it's not expensive. Well, so if we look at the, the three classes of users, moving from OpenVMS to Unix. Who is that? <laughs> I 
we may have uh, we may be on the party line, but uh, but anyways, th this so this is great. If if there are any more questions, I'll you know I'll take a, a step step back. Well, unfortunately, and, there's no effective way to isolate the system manager or administrator from change. Typically, uh, this individual is going to get taken out of the VMS environment, yanked out of there, dropped into the Unix environment, and is going to have to go native and use the uh, the tools. I think it's mad. Unfortunately, uh, while many of the there's similar functions in Who VMS, else be talking similar management about VMS? functions in both VMS. And Mad Dog may have a separate uh, consultation underway, in in parallel. Uh, but anyways, any any other questions, or I'll uh, I'll step back and thank you very much for your time on this. Yeah, on your benchmarks, uh, were they all single threaded? So, that's a great question. Um, I didn't do, and I'd be happy to share the code because I basically lifted it from someone else. Uh, there was nothing. Uh, to my knowledge, they they did not, you know, spin off separate threads. So I think the answer is yes. I think there's a program called... Uh, Hard info for Linux. Uh, you can install it, I believe, either through app or uh, snap, uh, and it should be should have a bunch of benchmarks you can compare your system against other people with, um, without knowing much about how to do benchmarking. Sorry, I, I didn't catch all of that. I'd be interested in it. Sounds like something with uh, snap, but yeah, whoever's talking is. Um... Needs to turn up his mic. I actually, to, to uh, I think it might have been Bill who asked the question about. I I don't I, and I'd be curious that basically the the prime number stuff and the Fibonacci stuff, which is you know essentially what those those uh, tests looked at, you know they're kind of recursive in nature, right? And and so I don't know to what extent it would make sense uh, if in, if in some way uh, they spun up either additional threads and or utilize multiple CPUs, but I don't know. I put a uh, a link to it in chat. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, that looks great. So it's got that. That's yeah. I, I uh, in fact, I may as we as, as Kurt and others are talking, uh, try and run them as we speak and see what it comes up with. Thanks. Yeah, I might try to do one of the open um, the open benchmarking suites uh, just to compare Ryzen's against Ryzen's. Uh, I I know they he publishes stuff daily there and and. You know, comparing a particular benchmark on one platform against another platform, you know, isn't it isn't really fair because the benchmarks are kind of tuned for the platforms. You know, they take advantage of of uh, the accelerators that are on the the processors on a given platform, and they don't quite translate bit for bit to another platform. But uh, but yeah, I'm going to try some of. Uh, I thought we might have Larabel here tonight, but he's uh, he couldn't oh, make run it. it. Hold on, I'm installing it too. Hard info? I don't have it on this machine. Yeah, why not? You don't have a uh, GPU in this though, huh? It's all on board on the motherboard? Uh, right. Uh, motherboard's uh, CPU, I mean. Uh, it's, it is, and, and that's um, basically why I, I went this route, and that's what kind of makes it uh, arguably a super bargain. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's... Pretty impressive. I mean, you get 
uh, decent, for instance, the even the older uh, Ryzen 3, which is where I do some video editing and processing. Uh, I mean, all that video stuff works great. If you're a gamer, no. But but the beauty is you don't need separate graphics stuff, cards, power, uh, and, and and all that. It's just all integrated. Okay, there is a uh, a GPU uh, test on that. Do you mind running that especially, please? Yep. So um, I'm uh, looking at it now, and. Thanks. When you generate, you can generate a report uh, of the computer, the devices, the network, and the benchmarks. And the the uh, under the devices, they separately look at the processor, memory. This is pretty beautiful. Uh, yeah, it's well done. Yeah, uh, sensors, input device, memory. So let's see where the. I mean, it, it's not the the best selection, but it, it for ease of use, you can just click uh, generate report. And you'll get a an HTML yeah. file that'll be for that um, that machine. Great, I'll, we'll let it fly. We'll select all and nice. generate. I can run this as uh, you know, and and post it in a follow up. Okay. Well, I can tell you my my DIY build experience. I've, I've only got about 15 minutes, and then maybe we can hand it off to Josh. <clears throat> now, I I compared notes with Brian, but we did in no way collude. I was I was more interested in the social experiment of building a $500 computer in 2021 uh, relative to, well, e even Brian's build from last year. He built a slightly under $500 Ryzen 3 machine in December 2020. I think we both built a slightly under, depending on how you calibrate the difference between the cost of shipping from Newegg or sales tax from Micro Center, $500 computer uh, in 2021. And let me tell you, uh, we're we're ahead of Moore's law on this one. Um, I would have to say this is, uh, you know, Moore's law. They say you know 18 months. So in 12 months, we've got a a machine that's twice as good as the 2020 build. Uh, and I, I will, um, you know, compare my 2020 build to uh, to Brian someday on my set of benchmarks. Um, <clears throat> I was looking specifically to build an HTPC, and part of the social experiment that I discovered was um, there is a huge gray market and vertical out there for people who want to put together YouTube channels to advise people on how to build PCs and in particular gaming rigs and HTPCs. So, so luckily I, so, so I'm, I'm in a very small part of the Venn diagram that I thought I would only have about eight YouTube channels that I had to watch. And it was, it was more like 80. Um, so, so what, what I did uh, to kind of end up in the same place that Brian did with his, and he's got a wonderful, wonderful spreadsheet. Um, you can sort by price point. You can sort by um, if you want to accelerate particular things. Now, he doesn't have them broken out so that you can uh, type in open foam, and it'll tell you how to accelerate open foam. He has it broken out so that you can figure out how to run cash intensive operations. And uh, and so I was, I was quite impressed with the due diligence that Brian did on his on his spreadsheet, or at least it, I was until I went to the Micro Center site, and I was like, "Oh my God, look at these tools!" It's not like the old days. I don't know how how many of you guys have been to Micro Center recently, but the experience was vastly improved since the last time I was down there. And um, you know, they're not quite fries yet, but uh, but the deals we found online, uh, we got some bargains by buying local that you couldn't get online either through Micro Center or Newegg. And those seem to be the two big uh, competitors. Um, I'm dropping a video into the into the 
chat that kind of directed me on, you know, nationwide, uh, these people that are big into building gaming rigs, they're doing a lot of the same things that Brian and I did, except that they were looking for something with a much better GPU, which of course would have would have ab absolutely <laughs> devastated our, our $500 price point. We, uh, we were doing great. Uh, there, there was, you know, four or five variations on Brian's uh, uh, decision tree there. You would still stay at a $500 price point. And whatever else, you know, Moore's Law uh, kind of defines uh, holding two variables static while you, or holding one variable static while, while you improve the other two. I think we, we could have gotten a $500 machine together, especially if we built around that that M550 board um, and, uh, and and been able to double the performance year over year, and uh, possibly one other one other variable, but but graphics acceleration wasn't one of them. I don't know what we're going to do about GPUs. I have I have a lot of links about how prices of GPUs are going to absolutely skyrocket, um, even on the um, on the secondary market on eBay. You can get you can get some earlier NVIDIA GPUs right now because the, the mining community is busy turning over to to another form factor. Um, but anyway, um, so my experience, I ended up with the same uh, the same part number motherboard as as Brian did, although his this was an Asus. Mine was a gigabyte, I believe. The uh, was it the M550? The so he had he he spent another five dollars to get Wi-Fi on his motherboard. Uh, it, it, you know, we're talking about just slight differences between you know optimum designs, and I, I was quite quite happy with the with the options at, at at Micro Center. So so when you go into Micro Center, you can get a wish list. You can show up there with a wish list that you put online. Brian and I compared a couple of those. Um, you know, uh, the great thing about building one of these uh, base nodes is you've got mostly five variables. If you look at his list, you want to pick your CPU, you want to pick your RAM, you want to pick your fixed disk, which right now I was just absolutely amazed at those NVMe options. Um, there's some peripheral issues you want to look at. Um, uh, Brian was interested in the HDMI options and uh, bought some cables. And uh, the only thing I didn't buy, so I didn't buy a keyboard and mouse. And for a while there, I was thinking about not buying a case because uh, I routinely turn my machines on with a um, Phillips head screwdriver. And I don't go through the effort that he went through to put in those those jumper wires. And the, the only reason I, I think I can possibly get by with not putting a case on it is I, I usually set these machines up in a corner and I never touch them again. Um, however, with this particular device, I said, no, I'm going to bring it home and use it as an HTPC and install Kodi on it. Uh, so, so if you guys want to go way back into the early days of doing this, when, when we would get rails of Athlon XPs from Sean Carr and we'd, and we'd take a number three pencil out and we'd reshort the the laser cuts on the Athlon XPs and make them into Athlon MPs. Uh, and then we, and then we'd build a, build a, a machine out of those and, and put what was back then myth TV on them. Well, so I'm doing the same thing now, except that I'm putting Cody on there. So Ubuntu plus Cody, and then I'm, I'm basically using it as uh, to drive. I don't know if I could drive Bill's Bill Bogstad's monitor. Uh, so, so I have a halfway decent television, an LG TV, but I, I don't think I'm getting 4k video. So that'll be my next test. Maybe I'm getting 4K video out of the onboard HDMI, but I suspect I'm going to have to to pony up for a GPU for that. But that'll be my next test. And Cody's Cody's pretty cool. It's not Matt, Myth TV gave you a lot more options. I think it was uh, it was pretty much a halfway decent equivalent to TiVo. Um, my one of my goals here is uh, I, I would like to be able to record the PBS shows when they air instead of having to sign up for for WGBH passport and having to pay something to see to see a show that only aired a week ago. 
but now it's got that damn little passport logo on it and I can't watch it anymore on the PBS app on Roku. So now so now I'll be able to do that with uh, with Cody and use it as a PVR. And oh my God, I have so much more hard drive space with the free SSD that Micro Center gave us and the and the NVMe drive. It, it's just, uh, you know, tell me, Brian, have you ever gone over to your PC and, and said, man, is the fan spinning? I mean, it, it's like you go over there and it's it's dead silent. This is this has just been an awesome experience. It reminds me of the good old days of of DIY PCs. You know, when I went in uh, and I went through the list with the guy at Micro Center and he said, you know, for another 125 bucks, I'll build it for you. And that and that's pretty much for any PC. You can part the thing out. You can have an additional. We only had, you know, if you look at Brian's list, we've only had about a dozen or excuse me, a half a dozen parts in there. They will build a PC for you for 125 bucks flat and then do burn in for you and some other things. Uh, <laughs> uh, impressive. I mean, I, 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 I was thinking that still brings me up to 625 bucks. That's a bargain for a Ryzen 5 base unit. Um, anyway, uh, I have one or two other links that I thought was, was helpful. Um, you know, it, it turns out, so these gamer sites are, are very hyperactive on, on staying on the, on the websites and, and, and watching pricing and, and watching new, new boxes coming out and, and, uh, and in particular deciding whether or not the, uh, uh, the, the, the GPUs are, are, are what they claim to be. And if they will improve particular games, so I so I don't have a particular game. I don't have any game. I'm just really looking for 4K video out of uh, out of Cody, and uh, so I think I got that for for uh, five hundred dollars. I I certainly certainly don't have any anything to complain about yet. And and sorry, Bill, I don't have slides. I had a complete train wreck last time I tried to do slides on this box, um, so I only have really the three. I could do three screen grabs for those YouTube chats, but uh, but instead I did uh, I did the URL with a you know uh, pragma t equals three minutes to to uh, to show you where, where I thought the, the videos got interesting. Anyway, and I and I like I say I only really have my system is very very similar to Brian's system, and uh, the the only variation is. He's using it as a sort of a traditional Linux development box, and I'm only really looking for for video out. Um, uh, as far as I can tell, I put Ubuntu 2004 on there, and I put Kodi, and I think that's it so far. I've tested out a couple of things. What I, one thing I could do? Let me see if I and this might help Josh out a bit. Is uh, I will see what kind of video uh resolution i'm getting frames per second things like that um and if it's if it's substandard if it's not driving my lg tv i will go out and pony up for a gpu and see if uh see if it's uh you know a night and day Im improvement uh it might be um you know that the video i'm getting i i don't have i don't have cable so i have uh over the air video and i've got internet so I'm thinking probably the video I've got coming in is going to be no better than 4K. Uh, so so maybe I'm I'm okay with the onboard. And I should ask after after Brian's done with that with that test he's doing, we should see how good that that 550 um, chipset board onboard video is. Uh, you know, because because just thinking about a GPU, I'm doubling the cost of the PC. So. Yeah. So we may have to do a follow up uh at some point Brian maybe a uh, maybe I'll get some more uh, some more benchmarks off of uh, 
you know, more more gamer device benchmarks rather than traditional Linux box device uh, benchmarks. Anyway, Josh, you have an update for us, or uh, or folks, I'm well, I'm welcome to answer questions or compare my my notes to Brian. What's the uh, the benchmark stuff first? Um, I, I guess I could come up with something to, to talk about briefly. Uh, I'm working on a couple of things, but I, I'm curious about the benchmark stuff first, please. My benchmarks? Uh, so I can no, post... No, the, the, the cheap $500 machine. Um, I can barely hear you. Could you go back to the audio you had before? Okay. Can you hear me now? No, it got worse. That um, you raised the noise floor, but not the signal, I think. Okay, is that better or <laughs> That's very soft. I might have to do the full audio. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, that's much better. Okay. Now, do we need to uh, remove Brian's slides so that uh, Josh can show his? Uh, no, yeah, I Brian, don't can you uh, I, I was un basically unshare your to, screen to talk? Yeah, Josh doesn't have slides. Um, no, it, it, I don't have a presentation per se, but uh, I could talk about what I'm, what I'm working on right now. Uh, and then... Oh, you're, you're getting the specs. Nice. Yeah, just... so one of the things that I, I've been working on recently is uh, I'm very interested in voice recognition for Linux, and specifically, I'm interested in offline uh, voice, voice to text. Um, it is, it's a, a long-standing computer problem, right? That, that's a Kurzweil, uh, 1970, 1980 or something. I don't, I don't know. And then um, it became available on Linux when, uh, with uh, IBM Via Voice, right? In, I think, 1999. Um, and then they scrubbed it, as far as I can tell, from the net. And it was freely available uh, at the time, but I was never able to get a copy of it um, after the fact. Uh, th there was a lot of attempts on, uh, from research labs, and uh, they were poached. Uh, I believe Microsoft... Uh, I believe, I, I might be misinformed, um, belief in information, they, uh, Microsoft ended up hiring and then licensing away uh, some of the open source, what would have been open source models for offline uh, voice recognition. Um, and that ended up getting integrated into, uh, I believe, the later versions of the Windows XP and then um, Vista voice recognition internal. Uh, which then got licensed back to um, Dragon Speaking Naturally. Uh, and all of this, meanwhile, basically meant there, there was nothing good happening um, on the Linux side. There, there, are a there were a bunch of labs that were working on voice models. I, I think there was a really good one uh, from, from Japan, and there, there was a couple uh, from other places around the world, um, and I was never able to get any of them working. Um, when Android uh, became available, Google spent a lot of money in making sure that there was uh, some amount of voice recognition for it. Um, and they, they, however, they did it in a combination between um, their, uh, their teams and, and other vendors. They were able to get the, the voice model to have fairly good accuracy offline. Uh, a couple of years back, Google updated, as far as I can tell, updated uh, Android and made it so that you could no longer do offline voice recognition. This is an accessibility issue. Um, and they chose to do that. I'm going to hand wave for whatever reason, but 
I would assume, or it has been, it has been said that it was to, uh, to scoop up everyone's conversations, um, whether that's true or not. Um, I'm not sure. But what I do know is if I very quickly unplug my router while I'm doing uh, voice to text, it, uh, it'll let me keep doing it. Uh, but if I click it a second time, so it has to go through the initialization, it says, oh, I can't do it without internet. Um, so when I, uh, so this led me to trying to find what was available on, uh, on the smartphone, um, the Linux smartphone Pine phone, and there, there isn't anything. Um, but this summer, uh, there's been some good progress on using uh, VOSK. Uh, someone was able to get the uh, uh, Python to be able to, to launch it in a continuous way. So it's a drop-in tool. Um, so I've been in the process of getting that to run on a Linux phone as well as um, uh, my computer. And uh, at some point uh, a week or so ago, I found that there there's a way to write a APK uh, um, for, for Android where you make use of Google's speech uh, library uh, and you can make it so that it doesn't call home. So you can still use it even though it's been disabled. Um, so what I'm thinking of doing, uh, and if you guys can give me any suggestions, is I'd like to start doing some benchmarking across the different uh, available platforms. There's, uh, there's speech recognition now uh, that's open source of the VOSK one, or, or at least um, freely available. Uh, I'll put up a, a GitHub page of that once I fully have um, it working well consistently on the Pine phone. Um, it's already uh, good on uh, Ubuntu, and uh, I'll probably put up the, the one for the Android. I, I didn't do much, it's just you know, using the default library. Um, and also compare that against the voice recognition that's available uh, for offline on the uh, Mac OS, the, like a laptop, um, which I believe is different than the iOS. Um, the iOS platform has voice recognition that also calls home. Um, I spoke with the with uh, Apple store people a bunch of times to try to figure out um, what happened because I believe they also used to have offline voice recognition. Um, what it turned out was they it seems like it seems like they've removed or or at least they're using a different engine for it. Um, and they've, uh, the offline model is only accessible through the accessibility um, options on the iOS platform now. Um, so otherwise, it still routes through their, their servers. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm thinking about what type of benchmarking might be available. And I'm, uh, I guess since I was told to, to talk earlier today, um, that's, uh, I'd like people's thoughts on that. There's a long-winded way to tell you how to, about the benchmarking that I'm working on. Uh, so if anyone has uh, maybe text that they think is worth playing and seeing the, um, you know, I guess that would be the signal to noise ratio, right? The, the accuracy of the um, of the recognition for each each system and uh, it looks like we have um, sales receipts and uh, build receipts coming in Kurt, do you have any thoughts on that? No. So, so we have <clears throat> we have someone that used to come to BLU for a while that used to work at Dragon Dictate. Now, now, what's the 
Hmm. Does that exist as a uh, company anymore, Dragon? Um, I believe so, uh, but it's a uh, paid service, and it seems like, from from what I can tell, it's a it's a online service. Yeah. So if if you wanted to, um, be able to work without internet, or to have a low end device or something, uh, it's not 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 available. Yeah, they just got sold recently. Or their parent just got sold. Uh, to who? To who is it? A big? Uh, is it like new like, ones? I think. Hmm. Well, it's the time to get out. Uh, like I said, there, there there's a bunch of uh, open source stuff that's that's been happening in the last year or two. Um, I didn't mention this, but a couple of years ago, Mozilla made a a open source. Um, voice recognition model that runs on the GPU. Uh, I think it was called like Deep Voice or something. Okay, I think that was the name. Uh, or Deep Speech. Deep Speech, I think, was its name. And uh, I, I never got it to successfully run continuously. So I, I, I could, you know, you can get it so that you um, record bits of information and then, uh, and then offload it to the GPU. Um, but the performance I was getting was not great. Oh, okay. Yep. And Microsoft bought it again. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> would this send, lend itself, Josh, would this lend itself to a device that had a particular accelerator like a DSP? I mean, is this is there some sort of a, uh, 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 you know, firmware or ASIC solution to this? Oh, absolutely. There, there are chips that are made for offline voice. Um, the the simplest ones allow you to record, like let's say, a hundred different um, samples, uh, and then it will do kind of a, a hard coded equivalent of a support vector machine or something, right? So it's a decision tree or whatever it is to to evaluate what it's closest to um and those work fairly well i've been on projects where we we've made use of those um but it, the, that's not for a, a generic um generic machine the the, the problem is uh, the, there are old um very very old um voice recognition tools that you can use I, i've used i've even used um via voice and stuff through like wine or um over a virtual machine piping the audio through, but it's um, it, it's not a those aren't feasible solutions like on a Raspberry Pi or something smaller. Um, what I very much would like is uh, you and I have talked a little bit about getting a um, a, a, a Risk Five board up and start being made, and I, I'm very interested in um, having a, a open source laptop design with. Um, more uh modularity um and but one of the things that i think is important for usability um is, is the voice recognition since it's it, it's been a long <clears throat> neglected part of linux yeah yeah i i um i've been looking at some of these projects that claim to be a hundred percent open source and and uh and then you you know you'd scratch the surface a little bit and there's one or two components that maybe not be you know so one so one of these mm. things is bunny huang's no novena laptop he doesn't oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. quite have a spec on every chip that's in there but he's pretty close and then yeah, um you good. know arm and lenaro have something called the morello platform so so they're hoping I, Arm only gets so open source, but uh, sure. But uh, but at least you know. So if you look at the motherboard and the bomb, everything else is um, it, well. You know, it's licensable IP, but it but they they publish the full spec sheet on on most of those chipsets. So 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 we might get there. I I think if if you wanted to, and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, next month. I think when we have the conference. Um, if you wanted to get into what Western Digital has made free as in free beer, um, Risk Five, their their Sferv, uh line, uh, you know, this is 32-bit Linux, but it's um, 
it's about as as open as you can get from um, you know from having an industry partner. There's a there's a lot of open source academic projects out there, but this is this is shipping silicon, and I can send you some links to the to the GitHub sites that are selling variations on this on this Western digital design. So yeah, pl please do. Um... Yeah. I don't know if it's got much of a future. I think you know all the big distros are abandoning 32-bit, so so Linux compatibility yeah. at 32-bit might not be around much longer. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know, I um, yeah, I, I I messed a little bit around with the um the 32-bit risk stuff, um on uh, on FPGAs, uh, but I I just I didn't have um. Uh, not mesh or net. What, what, what do they call that? The um, the ice chips are just not large enough. Um, I, I have the uh, the ice forty or the forty nanometer one, which um, which has only only such a large ca uh, capacity for um, for what do you, whatever you call that rendering out the chip on it. Yeah. Uh, what are people writing? Oh, okay. Debian still supports 32. Jerry, are there um, are there sunset dates for the Red Hat uh, Linuxes? Um, I think CentOS made an announcement, right? Or uh... yeah, I think yeah, I don't think you can't get it from Fedora. Yeah, and uh, I think that was last year. Same with Enterprise Linux and and yeah, okay. It, it depends with the enterprise Linux. It actually depends a lot on their customers, how many customers actually uh, need it and w are willing to pay for it. Has anyone here run? Uh... Linux on um, any of the, I, would, I guess we'll call them non-standard processors. I mean, maybe outside of Raspberry Pi or your phone. No, not me. I've run it pretty much on Intel processors. Does anyone here have the uh, the Pine Phone, uh, e even if it's not your daily driver? Repeat the question, please. Uh, does anyone have the Pine Phone here, besides me, as, as their phone, even even if it isn't your like primary phone? Not yet. Tell me more. Oh, uh, okay, sure. Um, yeah, I, I was going to present this over the summer, and I just never got around to it. Um, there is a relatively inexpensive uh, phone that runs Linux natively. It is, I've sent the link. If uh, maybe, Kurt, you want to share that on your screen, the specs for that. Uh, oh, well. It's a, it's a quad core all winner. Um, 1.152 they have a couple of different versions um it's it's like a five-year-old phone spec but it's um 200 300 um depending on i think the the non-pro one was going for about 150 yeah right now it's uh the beta version is uh 149 plus shipping and stuff um you can run um arch on it uh or whatever else you can buy to it uh so you can get direct terminal it's uh it can run kind of hot though uh, but it has a um it has a full mobile um modem so you can uh call uh with um, CDMA or GSM uh, on, regardless of whether 
you use uh, basically whichever mobile carrier you have is um, should be able to support it at least in the US. Um, although your results may vary, uh, but it seems to be fine on um, on AT and T and Verizon, from what I know. Oh, and it has uh, hardware switches for a bunch of the stuff, uh, and it has uh, I squared C available on the um, on the back on the inside. You can open up the um, where the uh, the battery is under the case. So. Uh, one of the things that I was working on was creating a um, uh, a trust chip uh, for it as an extension, and I I'm finishing other research for, for other stuff, so I just haven't got around to it. But um, maybe at some point I'll I'll present on that too. Uh, so I, I have a, a partially designed um, PCB backing for it that allows for hardware level. Uh, Encode, uh, encryption encoding um, with it's a I think it's a TI chip I forget the SKU for it um, so you can lock in uh, your um, and get like a hash out or whatever it's kind of neat stuff I can't share that web page because it makes me it makes me go away from the Jitsi screen. So um, okay. <laughs> maybe I'll do a screen grab and share it. Okay. Fun stuff. Thank you. Yeah, I get a uh, server not found. That's kind of surprising because I heard the alpha chip was alive and well in China. Uh, one of their big supercomputers over there. They they bought a lot of IP from, I'm thinking, Samsung on the alpha processor. And uh, one of their big supercomputers is is an alpha variant. Uh, so, yeah, and that's contemporary. Um, surprised Alpha Linux is. No, no, it, it's the, um, so Brandon just posted it needs uh or ed did uh it it, it needs the subdomain um www for, <laughs> for routing. of course of course you need to update what is that the a table a star table or something yeah. it's always dns there was some guy local who um back in the day when the department of commerce ran um uh, you know the the DNS business before it, it you know, before IANA got involved and some of these other organizations. Some guy in Cambridge uh, registered miskatonic.edu. I don't even know how you register a .edu, but but I, I went I, I I did a dig and an NS lookup and I and I saw the address that he had registered for miskatonic.edu, and it was an an empty you know parking lot in Cambridge and so so like Hernando's hideaway upstairs above a vacant lot so and I don't even know how you would register a .edu now they, they've taken all the fun out of it now that the Department of Commerce doesn't run domain names I, I tried to register a .edu once they, um, <laughs> they wanted uh, they wanted proof of a I believe a first and, and maybe a second graduating class at the time that oh was, yeah uh, I think that was like a decade ago though yeah, originally in the Boston Computer Society, we registered uh, BCS as bcs.edu. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and uh, then I think it was Jabber and me, we talked Barry into changing that to uh, .org. So it's completely easy to fake a university now? I understand. I'll, well, see, if I can, I'll see if I can dig this URL up. There was a, there was a fake football game. Um, some online college decided that they were going to try to compete in a NCAA bowl bid 
and they put together a fake football team to play to play somebody like University of Missouri or something. Let me see if I can find the URL. Is there a movie about a fake university? Uh, a movie? A movie, movie really? It. Yeah. The thing, oh, the, thing, the thing I'm thinking of is recent. Huh. Now, the thing with the BCS was back in 1991. Oh, yeah. So that was George City back then. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, I remember Barry was uh, in, in the meetings we had about it. Uh, Barry was talking about like uh, getting a domain registered was a really uh, onerous, uh, difficult task. So I, I went out, checked it out, and had the had BCS.org registered like uh, about half an hour later. Whatever happened to Barry Porter? I haven't talked to Barry in a very long time. I used to work in um, down there in Norwood in the same uh, complex, and we used to have lunch occasionally. But I haven't heard from him more recently. Yeah, I don't think I've heard from him in almost 30 years now. Uh, do do we have specs on the the machine from the main presentation? From Brian's box, uh, yeah. yeah. If he's not online, I can dig up one of his emails, but he might still be online. Yeah, he's still online. I don't know if he's paying attention, but yeah, his, his two uh, logins are still there. And just to get back to my previous conversation, the only one that I keep up with today from the BCS other than Jabber is um, Elaine Santangelo. And that's really because uh, his brother and I are Vietnam veterans together. Bishop Sycamore. That should have been the clue right there. That no good Catholic school would name their their school after a tree. Oh, uh, Brian says, what specs, Josh? I think to the system that you actually built, to your Ryzen 5 system. Uh, are you implying that they made ESPN saps, Kurt? <laughs> Yikes. Sap, please. Yeah. Well, we'll have to edit um, that out of the final recording. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ed edit me out completely, please. <laughs> uh, the the specs for the um, hard, hard info. No, no, the the bench uh, benchmark specs. I mean, sorry. It, it should have finished calculating by now. Yeah, are, are you guys there? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, we're here. So I I ran the uh, I ran the specs, and the ones that Josh seemed interested in had to do with graphics, and the the uh, for what it, little it's worth, the Fibonacci uh, specs roughly approximated what I already gave. So it didn't seem like there was that much. The the hard info report, at least the one that I got, it it, it gave the results 
for the Ryzen 3 and the Ryzen 5 uh, CPUs that I have. And then it listed a whole bunch of other uh, comparative CPUs, all of which seem to be, you know, kind of going back to the Pentium days. N nothing, frankly, that seemed uh, contemporary. Or So I'm not quite sure how they composite or or archive their comparison numbers. But the, uh, the uh, for the FPU ray tracing and the GPU drawing numbers, which seem to be the graphics ones that Josh maybe was looking at, uh, th they are interested in. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Maybe Josh can explain it. But for the ray tracing, for instance, uh, it gives them a, a measure of 12x in 3900 uh, megahertz, 1.96. And then for the... The, uh, the, the value I, in the leftmost column, actually. So you should get like something that says like 1.2 or 10 point whatever. So so the, the numbers they give for uh, ray tracing on the Ryzen 5 are uh, 1.96 and on the Ryzen 3, 2.53. Don't know if that makes sense. Uh, the Ryzen 5 has an indicator of 12x. I don't know what the x's mean, the 12 times. Uh, the... The, I think those are number of CPUs. Oh yeah, of course or, it would or be virtualized or physical. Yep, that, yeah, yeah, that would make sense. So, um, it, so anyways, it's one point nine six for the Ryzen five, and it's two point five three for the Ryzen three. I don't know if those numbers, relatively speaking, mean things absolutely to you. For GPU, absolutely, but I'm looking at a, a list for GPU drawing. I'd be curious where these things you know, uh, level out relative to i5s or i7s. Uh, the GPU drawing uh, metric that they give, whatever kinds of tests it's doing, I'm not sure, but it's 10,074 on the Ryzen 5, and it is 6848, 6,848 on the Ryzen 3. So th the Ryzen okay. 3 is about 60% of whatever that measure is it when it runs these tests it, it seems to draw lots of lines and plop lots of kind of graphics and colors and icons on the screen so uh i don't know it was it was actually they, both of them would have been pumping out to a 4k uh system so they would have been pushing out i guess the same number of bits so maybe that's a useful reference point as well hmm. anyways i did that's include good. those numbers in uh, the slides. I updated the slides. Nice. Thank you. I also included, uh, added a, a graphic of where the one of the M2 uh, connecting uh, gadgets is, and the other one's sort of uh, a mystery to be found later, I guess. Well, it sounds like maybe we're done here, unless anyone else has any questions. Uh, do we have any other speakers? I know Shankar's uh, not here today. Yeah, well, hopefully we can get Shankar back on uh, when he's back in, in town, and that, that would be fabulous. And maybe Kurt and I can do an encore uh, reprieve of, of any further questions that come up. Uh, John, I'll send you my slides as a PDF, okay? Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. And, and thank you, everybody who kind of engaged. It was uh, it was fun and educational for me. Thanks. OK. And uh, Jabber, I sent you a private message to Barry's uh, website. He's down in Palm Beach. Okay, so I guess that's it for tonight. 
I'm going to uh, shut down the live streaming if that's okay with everybody. Sounds good.